What up, though? Welcome to Gangsta's Paradise. This is where I kick cautionary street tales. Click that subscribe button, click the like button, and click that little bell. That way you can get notifications whenever I drop an episode. Support Gangsta's Paradise by purchasing a Don't Judge Me t-shirt from Teespring. And I appreciate the comments people leave in the comments section. It really schooling me to the history of the streets of Detroit. Steve Roussel. I did have a conversation with the family. As a professional journalist, I suppose to come back and let the audience know about my small mistake. But I did have a conversation with the family. Um, I know that Rock and Reg is not locked up because of Steve's case. And I was told that the little cousin left the door open and that's how Rock and Reg got in the house. We got together, we had a good conversation and we got something coming special as it relates to Steve Roussel. And a lot of people don't know that Steve Roussel is actually first cousin to my guy Vito. Vito is someone special. He's a special type of guy, you know, and I got into this thing really just to tell Vito's story. And that's how the Steve story came about because those guys are actually first cousins. And I was actually talking to my guy, which is Vito's brother, uh, and the Steve story came about. So Vito, I took it down. I will be recycling the story. And another thing about that in the last episode, or documentary that I mentioned that I created a partnership with Face English. Face English is actually Steve Roussel's first cousin. So Steve, Vito, and Face, they are all first cousins. Their daddies are all brothers. So I've been rocking with this family for a mighty long time. So we're gonna put our heads together and we're gonna come up with something special for Vito and Steve and Lil Chris as well i got something else coming with little crest i've also been in contact with hbo in which Vito and little chris come from that umbrella so we're gonna come up with something put our heads together and that's what it's all about putting our heads together and just coming up with a good story just controlling our narrative big ed is currently my number one episode and i want to thank the audience for making that request excellent choice like you guys said it's a story where it's all about big ed and that's it the focus was totally big ed and i think it was a cool story me and myself i listened to it a couple of times i like the story and people had a great conversation in the comment section you know about the theories surrounding that stuff and it, it just created this good conversation you know which brings me to my guys wise and blessed and change flames. You guys opened my eyes to the actual history of the streets of Detroit. We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we come from. Detroit needs its own mob museum, at least that's in my opinion. And at the same time, we must break the cycle of breeding major drug dealers to breeding major executives. Stop our intelligent young folks from going to the graveyard and into the prison system. But I like to tell good stories. So I have some docs I have to do first and then we will put our heads together to come up with something special. If y'all think it's a good idea to line up some interviews, I'm all for that. You guys are very intelligent. And like I said, you all opened my eyes to the actual history of the street gang. But on the flip side to that, Allow me to introduce some of the players from the 90s and so forth because people try to separate all the eras, but it's really all connected. You know, in the 70s, you had your inter international hustlers. In the 80s, you had your kingpins. But when you swing into the 90s, like I said before, we didn't necessarily look at people like they were kingpins because the game started breaking down. It went from the 80s where you had a handful of kingpins. When you go into the 90s, you got kingpins everywhere, you know. So it just basically became dudes, those dudes get money over there, man. Them dudes get money over there. So that's why I call the 90s 
the money getters era where whenever somebody somebody bring up kingpins they automatically look to the 80s but you guys are very aware of the origins of all this stuff who started the swag who started that person i, I really appreciate that because that's a part of our, our history so you guys schooled me to that side and on the back side you know a lot of my guys in the 90s you know they want their stories told you know it's a bunch of unheard stories that dudes was getting money out there you know was respected and all that so it is all connected even though people try to separate it all the 70s guys they influenced the 80s guys then the 80s guys they influenced the 90s guys and so forth and then you got your guys in the 2000s and so forth and you know even during the early part of the 90s you had a couple of crews i was hangovers from the 80s basically had that 80s mentality uh we want all the money we want all the power we want to control the market you know but you know the feds came in and stopped all of that but besides that we just pretty much looked at those guys get money over there we didn't look at people like they were actual kingpins we looked at the guys in the 80s as kingpins so that's my deal to you guys i appreciate y'all you know really trying to help me build something here you know and put something special out there you know we must know the history of the city and at the same time, I had to really had to dance around a lot of this stuff. You know, I can't do a bunch of name dropping like that. I can't mention locations like that. You know, just some of the things I had to deal with when doing stuff like this. You know, I got to be respectful when I try to tell some of these stories. At least that's my intentions. And I will be working with the fam, Face English, on future projects. It, it's going to be something good. We had a good conversation. We're in contact with each other, so it's all good. And I want to thank everyone that's making requests. I do look into some of these stories. It takes some time to actually do a lot of these stories because I had already got a lot of stuff lined up. But I promise to look into y'all stories, and I just want to appreciate y'all for making these requests. Somebody made a request, and as I looked into the request, I stumbled across this story of Lee O. Sharp, which many people in the media call the Sinaloa Cartel's 90-year-old drug mule, Leo Sharp. You know, when you look at the drug game, I generally consider that a young person's game. And even when I was in the game, I just vowed I would not go over 30 years old dealing drugs or running in the streets. So for me, uh, from the age of 16 to the age of 30, I was basically in the streets of Detroit. And when I turned 30, I basically gave up the game, cold turkey. That was it. Consider myself retired from that type of life. But when I look into these stories, it's like guys be catching cases. They be 40 and 50 and 60 years old. You know, the game don't stop. It's like when people join gangs when they get older, when that's generally people think you're like a teenager, or maybe you're 12 or 13 and you are in a gang or something, but you have people that join the gang, they're 25 years old or they're 20 years old or something. There's a lot of people getting in the entertainment industry and they want to start representing gangs. Uh, you know, that's real gang bankers can't understand that scenario because when you get like that age, you're supposed to be sort of calming down, you know, the more younger you are, the more buck you with it, with gang banging. So in general, for me, I always thought it was a young person thing, but the money talk, money talk. So uh, the age is, <laughs> age is not a number in this game right here. Even when you look at YBI, you know, they was using a lot of teenagers. You know, like I said, when I was in the gang, I started as a teenager working for other people, you know, flipping sacks or however you want to call it. but. Yeah, obviously when it comes to the hustle game in the streets age is not a number because this guy was 90 years old and he was a major drug mule to major cartel to a major cartel clint eastwood starred in a movie called the mule which was based on leo sharp born in 1924 known as el tata and he had his connections to detroit born in michigan city indiana but was raised in detroit michigan he was a war war ii veteran who eventually got into flower business where he was producing hybrid flowers he became kind of popular in that genre 
going around the country to speak in engagements. He even planted flowers at the White House for the president. So he's very familiar with the, um, the florist industry. He was breeding, he had his own farm, breeding these special flowers and butts loads of people will actually go to this guy to buy these special flowers. He had a farm that was near Michigan City. And just like any business, just like the drug business, business up and down business, unless you got this super pipeline, you know, his flower business, it started suffering a little bit. He started having some financial problems, problems and eventually people that were associated with the cartels approached him about being a drug mule, which is a sort of a good catch because you never think that a guy in his 80s is actually transporting drugs, you know. That was kind of slick right there, but you know, these cartels, they come up with all kind of ways, you know. It's a battle these, these people fighting, you know, this drug, uh, this war on drug thing, that's a big battle because these cartels and dealers you know we get really creative you know we had to find ways to get to our markets or to get into all of these markets and he, so from that point he started trafficking thousands of kilos he was traveling he was driving driving his same old truck this lincoln mark lt pickup truck he going down by the border he going down into arizona he dropping cash off here you know he's driving the same old truck and like the DEA say, he did this for over 10 years. So this guy was out there hustling, you know, just driving, you know, logistics. You know, 80 some years old, he like, I gotta get this money too. So <laughs> as I say right here, Sharp used a Lincoln Mark LT pickup truck to transport between 100 and 300 kilos of cocaine at a time from the Southern US border to Detroit, Michigan. And make sure y'all click that subscribe button hit that like button and click that bell. That way you can get notifications from whenever I drop a documentary. Special Agent Jeff Moore and his team in the Detroit Field Division had spent months investigating a local branch of the Sinaloa Cartel, the world's most notorious and powerful drug trafficking ring. You know, when you're dealing with these cartels, you know, they have a network of a string of things, they how they make things happen. Uh, distributors, couriers, wholesalers, and street dealers. And they had a pretty big operation going on with Leo Sharp, the drug mule, the granddaddy of the, hu of the hustle gang, the grandfather of the hustle gang. You know how people say the godfather, well this is the grandfather right here. And through wiretaps, and this is how they were able to trace Tata or Mr. Sharp. Which brings me to Antonio Pancho Simmons, in which somebody made that request. Now, he has a son that goes to Michigan State, and I salute that, and he's very involved with his son and trying to keep him on a narrow path. He's doing time in the feds right now because of this case right here, uh, the charges that he caught. Um, but he, he preached a message of not following his footsteps, and that's why I respect people at, you know. If you go through all what you're saying, then you come back and say, you know what, that's not a good idea. Don't follow my footsteps. That's the business, and I respect that. I respect this message of don't follow in my footsteps, you know, and he don't want his son to lose his chances on bigger things that can happen in life, so... Uh, but it's interesting. They say he was one of the biggest drug dealers in Detroit at that time. Now you're talking about the 2000s. This is one of the guys you can mention that came from the 2000s who was doing it big. But he uh, doing fair time. And it really brought me to another story. The Juan Street Lord Juan Wren, one of the, the original founding members of the rap group Street Lords. He ended up catching the case. Um, Poncho was, was his connect. I believe he's out of prison right now. And I would love to actually do Street Lord Juan's story. I really would. But according to the DEA, Leo was dropping these shipments off to Poncho. Pros prosecutors said that Antonio, 46, was one of the largest cocaine distributors within the Jose Bustamante criminal enterprise, which is a leg of the Sinaloa Sin cartel. The agents put a stink operation together. They doing an investigation. And I know why they were trying to figure out 
about this character Tata. They had to be in shock that a guy 80 something years old is actually this big major drug mule. Usually when you see somebody that, oh, it's like some type of mafia boss or even a cartel boss, you would never see, you hardly ever see somebody that's 80 some years old being a drug mule. But like I said, money talks, so it don't matter the age. Age ain't nothing but a number, I guess, when it comes to the hustle game. So they got this thing operation together. They, they finally on his trail driving this Lincoln truck with Iowa plates on it. You know, they start following him, you know, riding down I-94. He's heading for Detroit, his usual thing. He's not thinking that people are on to him like that because he knows that people probably wouldn't suspect a guy of his age transporting this much drugs. So they own him, they finally pull him over. And one of the things about these things, they will have like um, a regular police officer or a state trooper or a sheriff or something like that to pull you over so you won't suspect what's going on here. And that's what they did, they pulled him over. Um, they got him pulled over, of course he going through the thing, I'm 80 something years old, why you pulling me over? I gotta get where I'm going, you know, you wasting my time here. Hurry up and do what you gonna do so I can go. So. You know, that's what you do when you try, when you know you got all this stuff in the trunk. But eventually, they, the police, um, the one, the person who pulled them over, they already know it's a sting. They know the stuff is in the back of the uh, truck, you know. So they eventually pried it open and they got all these kilos out of there. Now he got this case. And it's like, if you catch somebody that's 90 years old and you catch him with all this dope, I mean, what are you gonna do? Give him the rest of his life in prison? You know, at that point, I mean, like, what can you do? You know, I mean, I know they couldn't let him walk away. You know, they gotta do something. You know, he tried his best to use his age to leverage his case, in which he did. You know, you gotta take all this stuff in consideration. Like, I mean, how much time you think you gonna give this guy? Like, literally. So eventually, they gave him three years in prison. Uh, he served like one year in prison. They let him out of prison. And then he ended up passing away on natural causes. You know, so I saw this story. I, I thought it was kind of interesting. I just wanted to talk about it. Subscribe to this channel. Click that like button. Share this 